Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it is March 31st, yes, 31st, 2022. And today what I'm going to do is uh, try and answer one a really thoughtful question that I got uh, based on uh, how to size your solar panel array uh, for to meet your needs for your home and all. And in this video, I'm going to go over uh, some of the history since I've been on the property since the 1970s. Also, uh, we'll go and check out a, uh, a video by Gord from GP Outdoors in Canada and some of the things he would do differently now that, uh, now rather than when he actually did the construction on his place. And then we'll come back and talk about some of the technology changes uh, that have occur that that are that are in the process of developing over this next decade, and uh, and I'm all about planning for the future. But let's get down to the question. So this is from Neil Sheldon, and it's a really thoughtful, uh, great question, and I think I'm going to have my text to speech reader read this for me. Uh, let's see if we can do this. I have to wonder why we're all having to do this extended set of calculations. I can see that it gets more complicated when you are figuring out what you need for a battery backup system. It seems to me that there are a couple of questions that could make it easier to figure out. The National Electrical Code, NFPA 70 that is National Fire Protection Agency 70, defines the requirements for sizing circuit breakers for a particular type of appliance and or circuit. Most household circuits today are protected by a 20 amp circuit breaker. Heavy duty appliances, like an electric stove, an electric dryer, an air conditioner, etc. typically have a 220 VAC or 240 VAC 30 amp circuit. Why can't we just figure out what we need to take care of each individual circuit in our home and size our solar system backup battery system for that? I mean if we're going to expect it to work just like our electrical system is supposed to work, according to code, and install a system according to code let's get a little bit more advanced and figure out what it's going to take to make it work that way. So, the first question I would ask is what is the size of your electrical service? And then the second question is what is the average duty cycle of that system? Bam. Done. I think most people can figure out both of those numbers from their utility bills. If you're using a battery backup system, first, you need a set of batteries that can handle that load for whatever number of hours that you would like for them to handle it, and then, assuming that you might consider whether your electrical system to be a life safety system or not, add something like 25% for a safety factor, as batteries can be affected by a number of factors such as temperature, atmosphere, etc. at some point. It can also become important to consider whether or not you might want to consider a backup generator, as well as fuel and exhaust concerns. Well, that was absolutely an, an appropriate uh, question and comments. And I completely agree with Neil <clears throat> that for, let's say, people my age who are retired, that don't see themselves making significant advances in their homes over the, the years in the future, this system using your utility bill and doing these, these uh, calculations and many solar panel uh, installers will do just this for you. Uh, I'm someone who really designs systems to meet future needs. Uh, so I thought I'd go over a couple of things. For example, in 1975 is when I first moved on to this property. Uh, in 1976, we drilled our well and we put in our septic system and put on a mobile home to live in. Before that, I lived in my car and lived in a porta camp. Uh, and, but, you know, things worked out. When we drilled the well, uh, the, um, the well drilling operation who's been working in this area, it's a family, uh, family run generational uh, business. And when they came and we hit water, I think it was like uh, like 40 feet, hit what they thought was really good water supply and all. 
and I came out and said, no, let's go deeper. And they said to me, that's nuts. Nobody ever has to do that around here. And we did. And, and I think we went to 170 feet before we got the water that, that, that really tasted good and that we had a bountiful supply of it and a really good recharge. Uh, I didn't know for certain how much water resources we need, but I knew back then in 1970s that water was going to be a very expensive thing. At that time, the idea of selling a bo bottled water was lunacy. Uh, when we build our home, the idea of installing a sprinkler system, which we built in, into our home back in 1984, we had a hard time getting insurance for our home as well. We got our electrical supplies from a, uh, a local um, electrical supplier here in uh, just in Fulton, New York. Discount Electric and Plumbing, we got a lot of our supplies from them. And they thought we were nuts putting as many circuits as we did and as many uh, electrical outlets that we have. Uh, so things change over, the over time. And I'm always trying to look to the future, anticipate what, what disruptive technologies are, are going to happen, and try to be as best prepared for those changes as possible. Whether it's climate change, uh, the hazard, hazardous conditions issues, water shortages, food shortages, all those sorts of things, those are things that, I, that I'm always thinking about. So back in the 80s, uh, I just went to look to see, so what were some of the big technology advances in the 80s? Well, the fax machine, answering machines, floppy disks, uh, pagers, and boy, I had my fill of pagers over the years in my medical uh, uh, training and uh, in, in my experiences as a clinician. Cassette tapes back then, 8-track tapes before that. Uh, and reel-to-reel -reel before that, Polaroid cameras, VCRs, and v VHS recorders, beta uh, recorders, and the first big bulky cell phones at that time. So things change over time, and I'll go over some things that, that we incorporated into our home as well in just a moment, but I thought I'd go to uh, GP Outdoors and some of his experiences that he shares. Welcome back to GP Outdoors and the next installment on the playlist on my channel called Buying a Cottage Property. Every spring, I get reminded of one of the biggest regrets I had when I built this cottage. The snow melts away under a midday sun, starting to uncover all of the equipment and components and tools that I have laying around the property because I have nowhere to store them. And hey, it's 100% on me. I had a great builder. In fact, I couldn't have asked for better. And throughout the build of the cottage itself, he kept prodding me and questioning me as to why I wasn't considering a garage or some kind of an outbuilding on the property. But hey, at the time, a lot of expenses, a lot of things building up, and a whole lot to coordinate throughout the build that I just figured it's something I could do later. And therein lies my mistake. So if you're one of so many subscribers that have shared with me over the last year or two that you've just bought property or you've had property for decades, but you're now in a position where you want to build that home for retirement or just for recreation with the family, whether you've got a lot of acreage or you're on a lake or both, let me show you a few things that I wish I had considered 10 years ago when I built this cottage. One of the things I didn't consider and didn't have the foresight to understand is that managing or maintaining a cottage property, especially when you've got large or bigger acreage, is gonna to require tools and equipment. It's not a push mower anymore. And that means you're gonna need somewhere to store your stuff. It wasn't long before I started running out of places to put my toolbox, all of my power tools, my equipment. When you get a property, you're gonna need at least a garden tractor, if not a tractor, whether it's a subcompact or a compact, you're gonna find, especially if you have land, you're gonna want that ATV or a side-by-side -side to get yourself into the forest. Chainsaws, other equipment, axes, trailers, boats, any type of watercraft, they all need to go somewhere. So, I cleared a spot for a garage. It cost me $3,000 Canadian. This was five years ago, just to clear that spot out to get ready to build a garage would have been a lot cheaper if I'd had the excavator do it while he was clearing for the cottage. A whole lot's changed in 10 years. 
The shoreline laws and regulations, allowances and conditions or restrictions have been amended twice. Shoreline allowance is now much further back than it was when I first placed the cottage. And, and they've implemented even more restrictive conditions around what you can do with the trees or any of the wildlife or any of the plant life here within a certain distance from the shoreline. They didn't exist 10 years ago. The solar system you see on the roof and the batteries in the basement, when I installed them, there were no bylaws or permit requirements or permit applications requirements for solar systems. Now, there's a separate standalone application and permit and inspection process including the submission of design and engineering drawings for you to install a solar system in this municipality, which likely means that when I try to extend or expand the solar system into the garage build, I'm gonna to have to put in an application, which of course comes not only with inspections, but it's additional costs. My septic bed. Septic bed up here will run you about 20 to $23,000 from start to finish. Septic bed is sized to the cottage. I always expected when I built the garage, I would have running water, a bathroom, or at least a toilet in there. And I was hoping that whatever simple design I put in, I would have a second floor up there. And instead of using it for storage, I'd throw a few beds up there and maybe a bathroom for when you have guests. Can't tie into this one. Bylaws here require a separate tank, separately sized to the other living quarters or dwelling, because it's no longer a garage, it's considered a habitable dwelling. It's another 20 grand at least. And of course it goes without saying, I'm back into a brand new start to finish permit application process and all of the related costs, engineering designs in the works. It's gonna cost a lot more for materials. It's been 10 years, not to mention the increases over the last two. Trying to get labor, especially in a building boom, it's gonna take a while to get that garage even started or planned. And we can't forget, to get a licensed legal survey done again. Although I had it done when they came out to pin the location of the cottage, I should have had it done at the same time and had them pin the location of the garage because you can't submit a permit application without a legal survey done by a licensed surveyor here in Ontario. And getting a legal survey done is not inexpensive. I've got higher costs for the septic, which I could have avoided. And at the end of the day, what I didn't foresee is that I was gonna need a lot of stuff here <laughs> and I was gonna need somewhere to put it all. And I can assure you, my wife is not too happy about the current home <laughs> all around the property, including the back bedroom, which I've had to take over for my toolbox and all kinds of different pieces of equipment or tools that I need because they have to be put somewhere. Well, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope you found the information a little helpful or at least provided you some things to think about as you continue your own build on your property. Have a wonderful week with your family. Please be kind to each other. And I'll see you again right here on GP Outdoors. Cheers. Well, thanks, Gord. Um, thank you, Gord. As usual, an absolutely fantastic video. Uh, I really do recommend subscribing to GP Outdoors. If you like the videos that we produce here, uh, he really gives that first person uh, new experience uh, developing a site using farm equipment chainsaws all that sort of thing and he's quite the gentleman and I find his information absolutely fantastic and I really thought that this particular video which he just uh, produced recently really fit with uh, with the topic of why I decided to go through all the calculations and to share those calculations. If you go back to the video uh, um, that I, and I'll make sure that I put links to each of these videos, when you look at this and you see this huge two large solar panel arrays, and we put the first part in, you can see there's a little bit of a difference here in the color. Some are a little bit darker here than the ones we originally put in. So I think we put in 108, 255 watt, uh, panels to start out with in 2000, uh, 2012. And then in 2017, five years later, we added on to it as well. Now we first put in the system, we put in a 45 kilowatt backup generator. And I have a battery backup system, small battery backup system that I built. I've made videos on that. And we have a secondary, uh, just a five uh, kilowatt uh, smaller generator. 
I'm one of those people that believe that uh, resiliency requires one to think about those things that are life uh, that are life essential or asset essential, such as food supplies and that sort of thing. And if you watch our videos, you see that we've got four freezers in our garage, three freezers in our work area, and two refrigerator freezer, three refrigerator freezers. So it's essential that those things remain powered all the time so that it's uninterrupted their power supply. So we have an immediate 45 kilowatt generator uh, click on whenever there's a power outage. Yes, these solar panels produce more energy than what we need, but it's for future uh, growth and development as well. All of these things are based on our particular location. We happen to live in a very overcast area, a heavy snow area as well, so we don't get nearly as much production uh, during the winter months and during the, uh, the, you know, even the early spring when we have all the overcast. So the size of our system was calculated based not only on our future needs, but excessive needs because during winter months, we won't have as much. And ours is a grid tied system. So, but it was designed with a future um, evolution of the battery backup systems. We could have put in a battery backup system at that time, but the battery technology wasn't where we needed to be. It's just starting to get to the point where we want it to be at this point. Uh, so Enphase, uh, Tesla, uh, and Jarek, uh, Generic uh, all produce beautiful battery backup systems and each one has their pluses and minuses. Uh, but this video I don't want to go too far into those topics. So regarding going by just looking at code changes one of the things that neil mentioned is since 1975 since i first started building on this property the national fire protection agency has changed their code 16 times uh, the um, the uh, building codes and uh, building inspections all of those things have changed multiple times and they've become more and more expensive over time so when we're designing our forever home and that's different than what i think neil was talking about the general public just that many of the people who watch this channel aren't the general pu uh, public they're thinking about their future needs or the needs of their children and trying to foresee those things that are going to develop over time so i thought i'd share a um a few things so technology changes so battery electric vehicles this is really i mean we've got the model y this is something that's happening over the next two decades the, the, the vast majority of, of vehicles will be battery electric vehicles. Lawn mowers, chainsaws, power equipment, the heavy equipment that comes to your, to your place, the tractor trailers that, that move equipment are all going to be transitioning to battery electric vehicles. Also, all electric home and equipment tools will be there. So not just your appliances in your home and all, and they would be much safer for fire protection, less and lower insurance costs over time as well. Vehicle to grid uh, power, where your batteries in your, in your vehicles could meet your needs during a power outage or during an emergency as well whole home smart redundant battery backup systems. Now right now we have uh, an automated battery backup, our 45 kilowatt uh, battery backup system that runs off of propane can charge everything uh, and meet all our needs. Uh, and, it, and it can also meet our needs. I can be doing welding in the shop and maintain everything on our property. But you know, we have a five kilowatt backup if that system goes down. And we have a small portable battery backup system that we can loan out to friends or people who are in need as well. So there's all of these possibilities. Um, the AI powered sensors, so uh, artificial intelligence powered sensors, those are a thing that's in rapid development right now. Smart surveillance and security systems with facial recognition. I've shown some of the battery, uh, some of the smart technology with our security system. Our cameras can lock on to uh, someone moving or an animal moving and catch, zoom in, get good uh, identification, license plate reading as well. 
all of those things and excellent night vision as well for, for up to um, one one of our cameras does 15 what is it 15 oh it's it's far better you can read a pack of cigarettes at the top at the going by and the driving by the road that's how how smart it is and we're th over 350 feet away from the road uh, smart homes is security advanced presence detection for your home and property as well now we have like the Dakota system and we have smart sensors around the property as well but the technology is really evolving tremendously advanced presence detection for your home and property in other words this is going to be very big energy saving and security for for people as well smart locks with uh, with uh, enhanced security as well so in other words being able to lock down different parts of your home uh, or your food resources those sorts of things everything can be secured in other words super insulate your your refrigeration or your roots or your uh, freezers and all in the event of a power outage and therefore you just don't go into them and therefore when there's a power outage you can get at least 72 hours before this, the, the uh, materials start thawing as well. <clears throat> excuse me solar roofs solar roofs are already starting uh, Tesla is really well known there are a couple other other companies as well the technology is still evolving at this point but they're attractive they the snow uh, and rain come off it they're self-cleaning uh, and certainly if you've got to put build a new home or you've got to replace your roof it just makes sense to get a solar roof at that point uh, instead of putting solar panels on top of a roof so that's important voice powered everything so those of you who've been watching this channel for a while know that since we built the home we started off with GE smart home technology and we've evolved over and over time so voice recognition uh, and we have to make this and I've made design uh, videos before um, so we have to make this so it's uh, I guess an easy way of saying it is idiot proof so that so that there's redundancy built into systems and security built into it and it's ease of of a, of a, of a real high quality user interface so people don't have to tr alert, train themselves how to use the system as well uh, smart surfaces those things are coming as well uh, medical diagnostic systems in your home uh, smart home lighting now it, it's going to go far beyond what we're seeing now uh, monitor systems uh, um, you know the smart home technology is going to change the whole way that we interface with the rest of the world like right now since the pandemic we think of zoom being such a, a, an amazing technology well there's new technologies coming out right now that are going to change our living environments make things so that we can shut ourselves off from the from the rest of the world or get as much information from as many sources as we deem uh, appropriate. Um, smart environmental control. So in other words, you're, you're, you're on your way home. Uh, you've had your, your home go into a quiescent state and just monitoring, and you don't need the heating or the cooling going on at the time. But as you get closer to home, your heat pump technology, as opposed to uh, various fired instruments or electrical heating systems your heat pump system will come come on that'll take the excess heat out of your uh, out of your environment so you're cooler when you get home when you're but that uh, excess heat will go to your uh, to your um, hot water heating system so there's going to be so many technologies will have uh, good um, uh, PM2 and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon uh, HEPA filters in our homes. So we're going to have more airtight homes, but with appropriate filtration systems as well. Um, so that's the smart home environmental control, augmented reality. So we'll be able to work at, at, at remote locations while in the, st in the comfort of our home with uh, with basically augmented reality and be able to the technology services for getting repairs done will utilize augmented reality to do uh, the, the the less than simple um, uh, repairs that need to be done in your own home so in other words 
someone who isn't well trained can can uh, do the job, the technology, or doing the repairs that are necessary. I'm trying to get through this. This is getting to be too long. Optimus Prime bots. So most people know about um, the various uh, uh, robot technologies that are that are that are coming about. I'm very uh, uh, interested in Tesla's uh, Optimus Prime bots using artificial intelligence. They'll be starting off probably working in in factories, doing jobs, the dirty jobs, the unpleasant jobs, and those sorts of things. But this could be like the Jetsons in the future as well. Um, smart textiles, uh, 3D printed uh, supplements. In other words, uh, you can have, you can, and this technology is, is almost available now, but it's rapidly developing, where it'd be, it'd be like a, um, in the old uh, Star Trek movies, going to a replicator. You just go to it and you'd say, this is what I want, this drink I want, this food I want, it will build it for you. Those things are, are coming. Um, smart uh, battery technologies. So the battery management systems are getting much, much better as well so that uh, we can use used, used batteries from vehicles and use it for our home battery backup systems as well. Uh, fire suppression systems, uh, you know, flood sensors, smart sensors, and alert response systems. To, uh, so these are things that I've talked about before, my disruptive technology um, videos. Uh, and those aren't as much liked as my gardening <laughs> videos and all, but these are all things that we, I believe we need to plan for. We started planning for these things when we built our home back in 1984. Sprinkler systems, super insulated, there aren't any um, um, uh, thermal uh, bridges. In other words, it's all thermal barrier, barriers, vapor barriers, moisture barriers, and wind barriers. Uh, all of those things and in super insulated. So the amount of money we spent over the last 40 years, almost 40 years, has been minuscule. That allowed us to put in this really expensive uh, solar panel array. That allowed us to put in a 45 kilowatt backup generator. Uh, so by smart designing, if we're designing for our forever home or for future generations, we can, I think it's a value to do those calculations and all. Whereas for the general person, I think you're right. It isn't necessary to go through. And if people are just thinking about uh, using their utility bill and they're thinking about the next 10, 20 years and they probably sell their home or 10, 15 years and they're looking for resale value, return on investment, th what Neil said is absolutely correct. So I just thought I'd make this video to, to help clarify why I go through the whole calculations. I'm anal retentive. I'm science-based and I want to do the math. I want to look at the data and I want to see how it all, how it potentially can turn out in the future in our best interest. So video is getting way too long. Sorry about that. If you found this video value, please give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends and feel free to comment. Let me know what you're thinking about this video and the videos that I put in here. GP Outdoors, Gord, you're doing a fantastic job if you ever watch this video. I just think I love your channel. My wife and I both watch your channel uh, every time you produce a video. Thanks so much and have a super fantastic day. Bye-bye now.